When we think of archaeology, we often conjure up images of Indiana Jones, old Pompeii or Egyptian temples filled with gold and jewel encrusted entombed mummies. Today, archaeology is more than treasure hunting in ancient civilizations. It can teach us a lot by simply studying the rocks beneath our feet. Extensive archaeological excavations have been carried out in the centre of Sydney by the Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority and have shed some light on some rather interesting questions. This cup fragment, for example, where did it come from and who might have used it? Recent research has cast a new light on the perceptions of life in the 18th and 19th centuries. And through archaeological interpretation, we can go back further still to the times when the Aborigines were the sole inhabitants of this land. The evidence of occupation by the Cadigal people includes shell remnants from the feasts of seafood on the shoreline of Walsh Bay and below Millers Point, just west of where Sydney Harbour Bridge now stands. Nowadays, these shells have a new use, burned and crushed for use in the mortar of buildings established by colonial settlers. Such material was incorporated into the houses and buildings that once stood on the Cumberland Street site, situated at the top of the historic precinct known as the Rocks, and located only a few hundred metres from the original landing place of the first European settlers. Right here we have the most extensive archaeological remains from the early 19th century settlement, still evident just a stone's throw from the CBD of a major international city. This has been open space since the 1930s, and even earlier, it was home to a thousand people, pubs, a butcher's, and perhaps even a sly grog shop. Convict butcher and publican George Cribb lived on the site in the 1820s, and thanks to an archaeological excavation in 1994, we've been able to learn a lot about George from the artefacts retrieved from his well located near his house. At one stage, the police believed George was dealing in illegally distilled alcohol, but were unable to find any evidence. Perhaps they should have looked in his well, because amongst the artefacts excavated from the well, we found George's still. Almost a million artefacts have been uncovered in archaeological digs around the rocks in the last 20 years or so. Studies of everyday household items tell of the transition made by many early settlers from convict to landowner and merchant. The belief that residents of the Rocks and Millers Point were generally poor have been challenged. The remains of expensive Chinese porcelain, teapots and other utensils that grace their tables tell us otherwise. Although they lived in cramped conditions, people did lead comfortable lives. Women had nice scent bottles. We found the decorative glass tops that had snapped off the bottles. The little girls had tea sets for their dolls. They used to collect shells and bits and pieces of coral for the shelves and for the mantelpiece. They had good crockery, they had nice glassware, they had bone handled knives and forks. So they were middle class, but they lived in very cramped conditions. Health officials of the time believed that it was this environment that created the conditions for the plague. According to historians, the bubonic plague broke out here in Ferry Lane, the site of another dig which has provided some very interesting information. It's surprising what you find here, but it is also surprising um, what some of these artefacts can tell you about the people that lived here 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Uh, we found bottles, so for example, this is the a top of a gin bottle, square face gin bottle, so we know they drank alcohol. Uh, we found the bases of wine bottles. Uh, for example, in lighting, we're so used to electricity, but in those days uh, they had kerosene lamps or oil lamps, and this is the top from a, a flue. This bottle here probably had some form of uh, medicine in it. Uh, quite often at the base is the name of a manufacturer. A lot of it was brought in from England and quite often will give you an address. 
So uh, you could even find out what sort of ailments that uh, the people suffered from. Now this area was fairly close to the wharves and we just found a, a nail just the other day. And this one is obviously a nail associated with, with ships. It's probably found um, uh, near the wharf, brought home by one of the kids or even the parents. Uh, this is a lower jaw bone, and we know that rats were very mobile in those days, and the plague broke out just next door to this house. Um, so feasibly, it could actually be the rat that escaped from the ship with the uh, bubonic plague fleas on it. After 1900, the New South Wales government announced plans to resume land in the rocks, demolish some of the slums, and build new workers' accommodation that would bring the community into the 20th century. The demolition to make way for the Sydney Harbour Bridge changed the face of this part of Sydney forever. As well as establishing the colony of New South Wales as a penal settlement, the British government was also anxious to use it as a military and trading outpost of empire. To this end, a number of forts were established to defend the harbour. A critical fortification was here at Dawes Point, where many exciting finds have been made as a result of recent archaeological work. Like so many, this site here at Dawes Point, beneath the shadow of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, has strong links with the harbour. Before the bridge was built, a ferry plied the gap between Dawes Point and the North Shore. Unfortunately, the cutting of stones such as this often meant that earlier structures were destroyed. For example, the first British observatory in the Southern Hemisphere, established here by Lieutenant William Dawes in 1789, was lost when labourers and stonemasons levelled the site to cut stone for a barracks and additions to a gun battery and fortifications in 1819. The marks of their picks can still be seen today. There's evidence too of a series of underground rooms cut into the bedrock and used to store gunpowder for the massive guns which were set up in 1857 to protect the city. Not from the Spanish or the French, but this time from potential attack from Russia during the Crimean War. In its 142 year history, the guns of the fort were never fired in anger. But the site remains today a symbol of the young colony looking nervously out to sea for signs of Britain's enemies. Further conservation of archaeological sites, such as here at Foundation Park, will ensure that future generations, as well as the present, will have closer links with the past. And what we're sitting on top of is some of the houses that haven't been dug out yet. This is an important part of the Authority's archaeology and heritage programs helping people of all ages to see and feel what life was like in days gone by. Footpaths, stores, pubs, restaurants may well have a wealth of stories under their surface. Shorelines and streetscapes may change, but the evidence remains just waiting to be rediscovered. Just like here, where in 1797, the colony's dockyard was established, cut into the sandstone at what was then the shore of the harbour. As we tread the steps of time, we learn that the rocks is living history, both above ground and beneath our feet. Archaeology is helping to provide a window to the past and to remind us that we do indeed leave a legacy behind us.